Sustainable development in the oceans means management for and of human beings. Humans relate in many different ways to the ocean. We have fishing, shipping, tourism, but we have also culture and tradition. In this chapter, we will learn how attitudes are formed, why attitudes matter, and how we can bring these attitudes into the management of the marine environment. So why do attitudes matter? How we see the ocean can be driven through social norms, so how society views or value the ocean, but it's also driven by individual perspective towards the ocean and how we relate individually to the ocean. And that matters because management will be always management of human beings. And how they see the management fit into the system will lead to compliance or non-compliance of management. So, as I said, we do need management or regulations and we do need the compliance for this management. And how people react towards management is very much dependent on the social interaction, their individual perspective and their individual situation in society. And it's driven by social and economic constraints. So how could attitudes look like? One attitude towards the ocean could be, the ocean is a vast empty plain, it's just a space where we ship over and transport things. Or it could be, fishing too much fish is unsustainable. You can easily see that these diff two different attitudes toward the ocean drives very heavily the management that we can apply. The one actually takes the ocean as just a space, so a vast uh, space that we need to cross or a uh, vast space that we can use or fill with litter. And the other attitude already contains the notion of sustainability. So the latter attitude could be easily used for sustainable management, whereas for the first we might need to actually influence the notion towards the ocean to reach a sustainable development. And the individual attitude has a lot to do with emotions, so we have an affective source of attitude, we have a cognitive source and we have a behavioural source. How we act in the environment and how we perceive the environment uh, influences the way that we see the environment. That was a very individual view of attitudes, but we also have society and societal view to the ocean, the societal value of the ocean. And attitudes are driven or are formed by societal values, social norms, but at the same time influence societal norms, social norms and societal values. So it's this interplay between individuals and society that drives our value of the sea and our, how we see the ocean. So to illustrate that, we use one study where European citizens were asked to come up with three things that come to, to their mind with respect to the ocean and climate change. And you can see here a wordle with all the expressions that came to their minds. And you see that sea level rise are, is very high on the agenda. But it's also nothing and don't know, which comes up quite high. So that is a very collective view of the oceans taking a lot of different European citizens into account. So if we break that up into different countries, you can easily see that different countries have very specific views to the ocean. So the first example is the Netherlands, and you see that sea level rise is high on the agenda, which is likely not very surprising, taken into account that the Netherlands is a very low level country. But it's also don't know which comes up quite high. The second example is Ireland, where coastal erosion seems to have a far higher importance for people. And the third is Estonia, where actually don't know has the highest value. So there are many differences in how people can see the ocean and many people don't relate to the ocean at all. What influences these different attitudes? It's your age, your gender, your profession, your relation to the ocean in terms of do I live at the coast or do I live in inland? Or do I have actually a profession which directly relates to the ocean like seafarer or fisherman? To illustrate how these attitudes can now taken into account in management situations or to, to derive sustainable management, we take two examples. A study where they asked fishermen to say whether there are any changes in relation to fish size, fish quantity, fish assemblage, and also to give reasons for possible changes. And the fishermen were divided into two groups, the young and middle-aged fishermen as well as the elder. You can easily see that the young fishermen or the middle-aged fishermen say that they have experienced an increase in fish size. And they are 
50-50 divided in terms of changes in fish quantity, either decrease or increase. But if you look at the elder, you see that the elder say that they have actually experienced a decrease in fish size and a decrease in fish quantity. All these changes are related either to taboo areas, which are protected areas, so to say, for these areas, or changes in technology or an increase in number of fishermen. So all the actors which are performing fisheries on these islands are seeing the change in the resource in very different ways. And to come up with a joint management system, you have to take all these different attitudes and views into account. So how do you do this? One way to do this is to engage in a participatory approach, bring all these people together and possibly also with other actors which are somehow using the sea in different ways. So for tourism, for example, or for leisure activities, which is in this case probably not that much the case, but this community very much focuses on fisheries. Bring these people together, talk through the different values and views of the ocean to come up with a generally accepted management system where all of the different fishers actually also comply to the management system. The other example that I have is a very global example. So we do have a lot of small island developing states and very small coastal states. And those states have formed an alliance of small island states to have a voice in the UN system to actually express their needs, specific needs towards the ocean and to have a voice in policy making. In 2014, the year of the small island developing states, there was a conference where all these different member states of the Alliance and also other countries have engaged in a discussion on specific needs of these small island states in relation to the ocean, also in relation to climate change. And that activity actually led finally to the establishment of a specific sustainable development goal for the ocean and the coasts. So through this participatory process and the engagement of these different countries, finally they have shaped the policy on an international level. So to sum up all the things that we have seen in the chapter, we have learned that attitudes can actually really matter in shaping sustainable development, how these attitudes are derived and how these attitudes can be taken into account when looking into sustainable development and developing sustainable management.